Good evening, Crossroads. This is Pastor Dan, and today is May 16th, 2021, and we're going to continue our study, or at least our look at our doctrinal statement, and um, particularly we're going to be looking at this point concerning God the Father. Let me say just a few words of introduction. As uh, I'm sure you know, or at least you should know, our doctrinal statement doesn't have a particular point on the doctrine of God the Father. We talked about that, what was it, two weeks ago now. Now, as we're going to talk about this doctrine of God the Father, uh, we don't have to go back and cover those things that we talked about when we talked about the, the doctrinal point concerning the true God, just theology proper. We don't have to go back and cover that. We can assume that whatever we said about uh, God in general applies to God the Father. And uh, we can also, and we're going to assume those same things to be true of God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Uh, to help us um, deal with this doctrinal point of God the Father in particular, we're, we're just going to look at three categories of things that will help us at least think about, help our minds grasp something about who God the Father is. So the first one we're going to say, who, the God, who God the Father is. Secondly, what God the Father does. And thirdly, what God the Father is called. Now, let me just say, this is not an exhaustive study in any way, and we are just scratching the surface. And one of the difficult things that anybody who's faced with trying to come up with a doctrinal statement or to sum up uh, what you believe in just a few words is that um, you're not able to say everything that can be said about a particular point. And in the case here uh, tonight, and even in uh, the statement at the end, I'm going to suggest that uh, is worth considering. We can't state everything that can be said about God the Father. There's no way we can put in a precise and concise way everything that the Bible reveals about God the Father, who he is, what he does, and what he's called. So we're just scratching the surface here, and so this is just representative of what the Bible has. So let's uh, move on here pretty quickly. So the first category that we're going to look at is who uh, God the Father is, and the first thing we should realize is that he is God. He's He's God. That seems pretty straightforward. We're calling him God the Father. So I just want us to know that in a general sense, when we talk about God, in our minds, God is the highest being that we are capable of conceiving. This does not mean that the person and being of God the Father is in some way limited to our imaginations, but only that in the mind of man, in our minds, to be God is to be totally unique, totally one of, of a kind, the highest being that we can think of. Even in the world of pagan mythology and religion, there is always one who is the highest being. And even in the world of atheistic pagan philosophy, there is always a person or a thing that is sitting on top of the hierarchy of things that exist. So whoever or whatever this is, for us, it is God. It is God the Father, in fact, of the Bible. He is the highest being that we are capable of conceiving in our mind or even beginning to contemplate. So God the Father is God. Secondly, he is Father. Now, the word father denotes the aspect of relation. In fact, father is a familial word. It's a family word. It's a word of, con of uh, connection, of close relation. And, and even as we consider the word father, we also note that along with it, 
there is the assumption of children. We don't call a man and his uh, wife, uh, if it's just the two of them, we don't call him father, we call him a husband. And so when children are added to the family, we call the husband father. And so here, when we call God father, there is the assumption that there are children. And so that's just in the title, God the Father, that's what we see. Um, thirdly here, letter C, we also know that God is spirit. He is a spirit in John chapter 4, verse 24. And, and let me tell you, by the way, you're not going to be able to look these up as I go because we just won't have time. I would encourage you, if you do want to do that, just stop the recording, look it up, and then um, hit play again. So John 4, 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So God is spirit. In other words, he doesn't have a uh, physical body. Letter D, he is the living God, the living God. So this Still talking about what God the Father is. So let me read these passages to you. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine, talking about Goliath, and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. This is when Jesus asked Peter, who do people say I am? Then he asked him, who do you say I am? Peter's response is, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Then 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9 says, For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. So in each of those passages, we see that it's the living and true God. Uh, and this idea of, of living is meant to contrast with all other gods which aren't real, which aren't living, which don't even exist. This phrase, the living God, is used 30 times in our Bible, 15 times in the Old Testament, and 15 times in the New Testament. And, and so throughout the entire Bible, the phrase, the living God, is referring to God the Father. Uh, letter D, he is a consuming fire. A consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 29. For God is a consuming fire. And that's who he is, but it also refers to um, a, an activity of his. Uh, letter F, he is light, he is light. 1 John 1, 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So God is not a light, he is light. Uh, God is light, but light is not God. So you can't reverse uh, what this verse says. Um, and so God is light. In particular, here in this verse, the contrast that we see here with light and darkness is the contrast between absolute purity, absolute holiness, and sin. So to say that God is light is to say that he is totally separated from sin. God and his being has, can have no connection to sin. Letter G here, God is love, 1 John 4, 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So just like the phrase God is light, here God is love. You can't reverse them. You can't say love is God. You can't, that doesn't work. 
God is love. Letter H, he is truth. This is Deuteronomy 32, 4. Um, he is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upbringing. Uh, is he. So God is truth. He is absolutely true. Truth resides in God. In fact, God by definition is truth. And uh, what God says is always true. God can't lie. Uh, God can't say something that isn't true. God is truth. That's our definition of, uh, of truth. It's God. It's God. Uh, letter I. He is God of gods and Lord of lords. Deuteronomy 10, 17. Deuteronomy 10, 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes bribes. So uh, this again is elevating who God is. He is God of gods and Lord of lords. Of lords, there is no one greater. There, there's no uh, nothing greater than God. There is no heavenly or earthly being greater than God. Letter J. And I've just listed a bunch here. There's, there's many more that we could list here, and here's just some more. He is a fighter for Israel, a refuge, king of all the earth. Helper, salvation, glory, merciful, pure, jealous, and we could go on and on and list more of these, but we don't have time. There's a, actually one that I didn't include here that I want to bring up at this point, and that is uh, he, he is a giver. God is a giver. Um, I was struck by the fact that I was as I was studying this topic, and, uh, of course, I, I was starting in Genesis and heading my way to Revelation. And one of the things that I noticed was used more often of God than anything else uh, in the Pentateuch, in the first five books of the Bible, is that God is a giver. Over and over and over and over again, it talks about God is a giver. And so uh, God, we might say God provides or God is a provider or something like that. But over and over again, God is a giver. And, and finally, I want us to also realize that God is incomprehensible. He's incomprehensible. Now, I don't have a, a particular passage about this other than um, uh, where is it written? Um, you know, our ways, uh, God's ways are not our ways. Who, who can know his mind? Um Somewhere in the Psalms, somewhere in the Proverbs. Hebrew poetry is where uh, that's located. But God is incomprehensible. And so one thing that we have to remember is, is that something that makes God God is that we as mere human beings cannot totally or even adequate, adequately comprehend him or who he is. We can't understand the being of God. Our minds won't allow it. They are too uh, limited. They are too small. God is infinite. Our brains are finite. The finite cannot comprehend the infinite. We can only recognize uh, that God is infinite. So uh, anytime we're talking about God or any of the persons of the Godhead, we have to recognize there is a, a limit to what we can comprehend, and, and that limit jumps up on us a lot sooner than we might expect. So this is talking about what God is, um, these things A through K. Now let's consider what God does. What God does. Um, this is probably the area that is most useful for distinguishing the persons of the Godhead. We might put it like this. While the three persons of the Godhead are equal in essence and being, they are distinct in function 
and relationship. And so when we talk about what God the Father does, we're talking about how does uh, God the Father function? How does he relate? And as with uh, what God the Father is, there are a lot of things that we could list here. So um, just be prepared. We're not going to list uh, everything here. Um, I have, uh, let me look ahead here in my notes. I have A through G. Uh, A through G. What's that? Seven points that we're going to consider. So let's jump into these. First, he created. He created. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this is talking about God the Father. And while there's other passages, uh, later passages, that refer to how the other members of the Godhead were involved in creation, the one who is the ultimate creator, the one to whom ultimately the creation must be attributed to, is God the Father. Secondly, he sovereignly rules. He sovereignly rules. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 10. Go look at verses 10 through 12. Verse 10, Therefore David blessed the Lord before all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now, in those three verses, you can't pick up, uh, you can't miss the fact that David is talking about God's sovereign rule, how he sovereignly rules. Another passage to consider is Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. And uh, you might notice this is the prayer that the Lord Jesus taught his disciples. This is at the end. And it says, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So when we consider God the Father sovereignly ruling, we have to consider this. Uh, God the Father could be a narcissistic dictator as a sovereign ruler, but he's not. God could just be a paper figurehead sovereign who would abdicate his authority and his power to another, but he hasn't. God the Father, while delegating to others the responsibility and authority to rule, has nevertheless maintained his supreme rulership over all. I was struck with the fact this week that uh, when God created Adam, God delegated the rule over the earth to Adam. Uh, God was ruling through Adam. I was also struck by the fact that in uh, when, the, when the Messiah returns, when Christ returns to the earth to set up his kingdom, at the end of uh, the, the messianic kingdom, at the end of the millennial kingdom, uh, Jesus Christ then turns his kingdom over to the Father, so that the Father will be all in all. So God the Father... When, when we think about God the Father as the sovereign ruler over all, it's, it's most clearly seen in the kingdom language, uh, how the Bible talks about his kingdom. And uh, when we study that idea in our Bibles, we find that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the words for kingdom really are not focused on a place, a land, an area, or a sphere of rule. They're not 
really focused on the people or the subjects of a ruler, the most essential thing about kingdom is the right and authority to rule, the, the exercise of ruling. And so when we talk about God's kingdom, we're talking about God sovereignly ruling. And so this is what God does. This is one of the things that God does. Let's move on to letter C. Uh, he plans. God plans. Three verses there. Let me read those uh, to you. Actually, six verses there. No, five verses there. Acts 2.23. Him being delivered by, listen, the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God you have taken by lawless hands have crucified and put to death. And you get that by the determined purpose. That is indicating planning. Romans 8, 28 through 30. And we know that all things work together for, for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. So predestined, that word, is a word that indicates planning. And in the case here, and actually in the case of Acts 2.23, this planning is based upon God's foreknowledge. And then in the rest of Romans 8, 28 through 30, you see the plan that God has laid out. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. In him we have also obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel or plan of his will. So, uh, again, these three passages are clear indications that one of the things that God the Father does is that he plans. He has made a plan. So the Bible is full of allusions to God's plan. Uh, to know that God has a plan we don't need to see the planning process or even a uh, direct, complete statement of the plan. The only thing we need to see is references to his plan, and those are all over the Bible. And I just find it so interesting that when it talks about God's plan, that it, it, it involves um, him using his intellect, using, we would say, his mind, um, God doesn't have a brain, but he has a mind, using his mind, making a decision, and then taking action in his decision. But we see God plans. Letter D, he works. God works. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 29. And these are diverse, excuse me, let me start over. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. So works all in in all. So God the Father is a God who works. Letter E, he gives. Now, I already alluded to the fact that there's many passages in the Pentateuch that talk about God the Father being a giver. But in the New Testament, probably one of the most familiar ones is James chapter 1 verse 17. And, and listen to the language. Every good gift now, when you have a gift, the assumption is that it's given. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So God the Father is the giver, and here he gives good gifts and perfect gifts. Two more real quick. I'm not going to list the passages because there's so many, but uh, he saves God the Father saves, and God the Father heals or uh, restores. Again, there's passages all over the Bible that talk about that. Well, I've got five more minutes here. Let's, let's move on, see if I can do this. Let's talk about uh, what God the Father is called. So we're going to look at, these are the names of God, some of the names of God, not all the names of God, but some of them. Uh, the names, names in the Bible are important, not only because they distinguish people, one from another, but they also are used as descriptions for people. And the names of God are no different. They can tell us a great deal about uh, God, who he is, and what he does. And there's three categories that I want to think about. Uh, number one, um, we're going to think about the names of God according to his title, which is God. Okay, 
That's number one. Number two, we're going to think about the names of God as related to his personal name, Lord, as in capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And thirdly, in relation to his activity as a sovereign ruler or master. Okay, so let's look at the first category, and that is God. El, the Hebrew word for God is El. So we have four names I want us to consider here real quickly. So we have Elohim. Elohim, you see El at the beginning. Elohim. Um, in the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. So, so Elohim is the plural form of God, and we call this the plural of majesty. It's not referring to more than one person. It's referring to a singular person. And, and the idea is that the plural is used to emphasize the greatness of the person. This is a very common thing in the ancient Near East, so um, this is nothing unique to the Bible. But Elohim is the uh, plurality of majesty here. The, so the I am ending there is like in English putting an S on to the end of the word. So Elohim, the im ending is the plural ending. The next name, El Shaddai. El Shaddai. Two references here. Um, the first reference, of course, is the, the Hebrew. And then the second reference is, is how this comes over in Greek. So Genesis 17.1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. So that phrase, El Shaddai, Almighty God, or God Almighty. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and is to come, the Almighty, the Almighty. So the Hebrew word that we're considering is El Shaddai. The Greek word is uh, Pantocrator. Pantocrator, which is the word all and rule together, so it's like a ruler over all. Um, now what is interesting about this word uh, or this phrase El Shaddai that comes over to our English Bible says God Almighty um, is is I think it's interesting because the Hebrew the meaning of the Hebrew word isn't exactly clear here. Um, the the exact meaning of the Hebrew word should die um, is up for debate. It is it is just as likely that the term should die expresses the idea that God is the one who nourishes, sustains, and provides sustenance. And this makes, actually, this makes sense in the Genesis 17, 1, because uh, God is talking to Abraham about him having a son, and he's going to sustain his family. He's going to provide for his uh, uh, generations to come through giving um, Abram a son. Number three, El Olam. El Olam. This is... Uh, God everlasting, God eternal, or the everlasting God, the eternal God. Genesis 21, 33. Then Abraham planted a uh, tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And of course, that's just a, a, a saying that God has no beginning, no end. Finally, one more under El. It's El Gabor. El Gabor, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called. He has uh, four names that are given here. Number one, Wonderful Counselor. Number two, Mighty God, El Gabor. Three, Everlasting Father, Fourth Prince of Peace. So we're interested in Mighty God, the El Gabor. And we know while this 
particular verse is referring to the Messiah in particular coming in the form of a male child. Um, it, this, the, the verse is telling us that the male child is going to be God. And so this fits uh, a name for God the Father, that he is the mighty God. He is the El Gabor. And in, in fact, this particular phrase, El Gabor, is, is probably a more faithful expression of mighty God or almighty God than El Shaddai. And so that's, that's four names that are connected with the title God. Now let's look at the personal name. Let's look at God's personal name. And this comes over in our Bible as capital L-O-R-D. And uh, let me see how many I have here. So I'll have to move through these pretty quickly. There's eight of them. So let's see how fast I can go, go here. First, there is Jehovah or Lord. This is God's personal name. We see this in Exodus chapter 3, verse 15, where uh, uh, Moses is talking to God. And God has given Moses a mission. He's given him a message to say to the children of Israel. And, and Moses says, well, if I go there and they ask uh, who sent me to them, what am I supposed to say? And God uh, says to Moses, I am who I am. And so thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Okay, so um, that phrase, I am, is represented with the words uh, Jehovah or the word Lord with all capital letters. And, and so this is God's personal name. Now, one of the things we struggle with is how do we pronounce the name. You'll see the letters there on your screen, Y-H-W-H, there at the top of your screen in quotation marks. How do we pronounce that? Um, the, the, the ancient Jews and even Orthodox and Hasidic Jews today will not pronounce the name, uh, this name, for God out of reverence. Now, this, this limitation that they have taken upon themselves is not a real limitation. They have they have done that, I think, mistakenly out of some type of perceived reverence to God. But remember, we just read the passage in Exodus chapter 3, verse uh, 15, where God tells them his name. He gives to them his name. Now, uh, the children of Israel don't know God just by his title. They are connected to him by his personal Name And therefore, we can use it. It's not in, irreverent to pronounce uh, God's personal name. So how do we, how do we pronounce his uh, name? Well, this name, as it appears in Genesis 3.15, uh, is something like Ehye, Ehye. But when we get to verse 16, we see this name again, and it's pronounced something like Yehwah, or Yehweh, Yehweh, with a yeh on the front of it. And so in the end, I say pronounce it um, in the best way that you know, whether it's uh, Ehya or uh, Yehweh or something like that. And, um, you know, as long as you know what you're talking about, you're not being irreverent uh, to God in any way. And uh, most people won't even know if you're mispronouncing it or not. But this is God's uh, personal name. Uh, number two is Lord Sabaoth. Lord Sabaoth. Uh, Samuel chapter 17, verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Lord of hosts. That's Lord Sabaoth the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have uh, defied. And so this is speaking of the one who fights for Israel, who defends Israel against her enemies, the one whose power and might even the nations can't stand against. This is the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts. Next is 
uh, Lord Jaira or Yaira. Uh, some people, the, probably the most common is Jehovah Jaira is how people refer to this. Uh, this is found in Genesis 22 verses 13 through 14. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a man, a ram, caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide provide. Now, we are faced again with an interesting circumstance of translation here that probably does not uh, most accurately reflect what is happening in this passage. Um, this word gyra there you see in blue comes from the verb uh, ra'ah, which means to see or to know. So you see the R in the middle there of uh, the blue. Uh, the words in blue, you see the R there. Uh, that is representing the verb to see, to know, or to show oneself. Now, in this passage, verses 13 through 14, I want, I want to point out something to you. It says at the beginning of verse 13, Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. That word looked is ra'ah. He ra'ah. He looked. He saw. And what did he see? He saw this ram caught in a thicket. And what did he do? He went and got the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And then, he, then Abraham called the place literally... Yahweh Jerah, or, or something, something close to that. I'm not a Hebrew uh, uh, scholar here, but uh, Yireh or something like that. But he says, the Lord sees or the Lord shows himself. And so I, I would, um, I would, I would kind of, uh, uh, suggest to you that that the word here provide is not the best translation. That might be an interpretation that comes from this, but the Lord shows himself. And what's the Lord showing himself here, uh, showing himself as here in this passage? Well, he's showing himself faithful to Abraham and that uh, uh, Isaac is the promised son, the son of promise, the one through whom the promise will uh, continue on, and, and God has showed himself faithful uh, to Abraham. Anyway, something, something to think about. A fourth word, Lord Rapha, Lord Rapha, Exodus 15.26. And said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. So uh, when it talks about the Lord healing, in this particular case, it's talking about a physical protection from the plagues that the Egyptians experienced. Um, it's not talking about a spiritual thing in this case. However, this word, Rapha, is used for spiritual healing as well. Uh, consider Isaiah 53, 5. By his stripes we are healed, rapha And so uh, this is the Lord as healer, the Lord as healer. Uh, next is Lord Nisi, Lord Nisi. Exodus chapter 17, verse 5. And Moses built an altar and called, called its name, The Lord is my banner. And again, this has the idea of protection. The Lord uh, is banner, a, a protective covering. Uh, next, we have, have Lord uh, Shalom. The Lord is our peace. 
This is found in Judges chapter 6, verse 24. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it is still in Ophrah of the Abbey Ezrites. So Lord is Peace. The Lord is the one who brings peace. It's probably the idea. Uh, Lord Rohi, or actually um, would be Rohi, Lord Rohi. Uh, Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd. Here, the Lord is shepherd. Lord shepherd talks about his, his care of his sheep, the care of the nation of Israel. And finally, <clears throat> uh, Lord, uh, let me see if I can say this. Um, uh, Tzedeknu, Tzedeknu, I'm trying to get that T-S sound in there. Tzedeknu probably is the best way to say it. The, the Lord is righteousness. The Lord is our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 6. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. And this is pointing to the millennial kingdom. The Lord, our righteousness. Now, I would just point out, um, I noticed this in the New King James. I did not check other Bibles, but the Lord, our righteousness, the word Lord there is capital L, then it goes to lowercase o-r-d. Well, that's not correct. It should be all caps, because this is talking about uh, Yahweh, Yahweh, uh, the Lord's personal name. Uh, finally, I want us to consider uh, this term Adonai. So this is another word that's used of God the Father in the Old Testament, and it simply means master, the one who rules. He is the ruler. And so this, this is very much in line with God sovereignly ruling. So we have went through a lot of information about God the Father, and we're just scratching the surface here. So I, I wanted to put before you a possible statement about what we believe about God the Father. Now, remember, this statement isn't uh, talking, isn't going to say everything we know. It's going to try to summarize in a concise way what we believe about God the Father. So let me let me put this, and you can read it with me. It says we believe that God the Father exists eternally as Father and Spirit, is light love, truth, holiness, and judge, is worthy of all worship, praise, and honor, is the righteous standard by which all things are measured, functions as the first person of the Godhead, providing direction and purpose to the other members, is the source and end of all things, is sovereign over all, and to whom all will one day submit. Anyway, that's the, just something that um, I'm working on and working with. I think this is probably one of those areas in our doctoral statement that we do need to add a statement about God the Father since there's nothing there. And uh, we're just trying to, to uh, work this out to see what would be the best way uh, to state what we believe about God the Father. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, didn't go 45 minutes this week, so that's pretty good. And uh, continue to pray for one another. Many people in our church uh, need your prayers for special things, but we all need your prayers just for everyday life, for us living godly as to the Lord. And so um, go with the Lord's blessing.